Well, good morning. Great to have you here, and uh, you know, whatever season this is. <laughs> oh boy, isn't it something? I, uh, you know, with the snow yesterday and everything, it's and last night waking up this morning, it was absolutely beautiful, though, wasn't it? Just to see everything covered white as snow, and no, oh, okay, never mind, <laughs> never mind. Um, yeah, well, let's just uh, continue our time together in worship. Father, we thank you for uh, the seasons, and, and certainly we are so excited to be in spring. And uh, Father, just thank you for how the white snow just covers everything and reminds us of how you see us as pure, as driven snow, as sinless, as being forgiven, and how wonderful is that truth. Father, we come before you this morning, continue to pray for those in our congregation who are struggling with any number of things. We think of the Rome family and Gina, her mom. Uh, so we saw her this week in a nursing home and rehab center, and now she's home, and she needs 24-hour care seven days a week. And Gina being uh, her only child, uh, it's a lot on the family. And so we just lift them up, and, and um, Gina's mom, uh, Donna, and Lord, just a very difficult time as and all of us who have had parents who've gotten elderly and passed away, and uh, the process is a very difficult one. So, Lord, we just lift them up and pray for strength and energy and for help that they need. God, that you would just bring people alongside of them to encourage them and pray for them. Father, we thank you for Easter, and we thank you what uh, the, the, the victory over sin and death, the resurrected Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father, uh, how fortunate we are to know those truths and to, to be able to have that kind of power in our lives, to live lives that are truly extraordinary. Father, we pray for the search committee, and Father, it's such an important process in the life of a church, and uh, uh, who comes next and who will be working with the, the ministries and the people here. Father, we just pray for that right person, that couple that will come, Lord, that it would be your people and your place and your time. Father, and so we trust you and we're looking to you. Thank you for the search committee and all the work, all the meetings. Uh, Father, these things take time and uh, sometimes years. And uh, so, Father, we just lift them up and uh, pray you continue to give them the energy and strength to, to do what they're doing, Father. And for the candidates, Lord, that they're interviewing for them as well, that, uh, God, you would just guide and direct them. And uh, we pray for them, Lord, because we know that this is a huge step in their lives. So we just thank you that we can come before you and knowing that you love us and you care for us. And Father, it's um, like giving a daughter away in marriage, really. Um, you're, you really want the, the person that, that your daughter marries to be that person. And that's how we feel about the church. We love the body here. We love you. And Father, we're praying that uh, there just be the, the right marriage uh, of ministry leaders coming here, Lord. And we know that that's what you want as well. So we just thank you that we can come before you, Lord. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Well, we're continuing in Romans, and Romans is such a great letter. And uh, the chapters 9, 10, and 11, a lot of pastors kind of skip over those kind of chapters, and, and uh, there's reasons for that, but we're kind of just plowing through here. And I just want to read something that's important. Context is king, right? 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 Context. So... I just want to share this. With regards to these three chapters, I just want to state this on the offset. The underlying issue found within them is not salvation. It is written, uh, it is in whom God chooses to use and how he chooses to use them. So I say that because it's very important we understand as we're looking at context what God is doing and who he is talking to and the purpose behind this. And uh, what's great is, this uh, statement I read, I was reading an article, and I forget where I read it. I read a lot of different things, and sometimes I forget. Uh, but this was written on the side of a Nigerian bus, and uh, the statement said this, no man be God. No man be God. I really like that. I mean, that's just right there, isn't it? No man is God. And in our culture today that we're living in, we all want to be gods. We live in a humanistic society where we're gods, and we can pick and choose our morality. We can, pick, we can do what we want because we're gods. And um, <clears throat> we saw that with Pharaoh in, in looking at the illustration of how God showed his grace really to Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go after their years of captivity. 
And he gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And it says, and Harold, Pharaoh hardened his heart. So we, we see that, that God's grace, and even when he's dealing with people, he shows and demonstrates his grace. God is, one of his attributes is, of course, his sovereignty. But, you know, sometimes we get caught up with just one aspect of God's sovereignty. It's like the spokes on a wheel. Which spoke is more important than the other? The answer is they're all significant. That's just like if someone asked me, tell me about Mary Ann. She's a great cook. Yeah, okay, tell me about Mary Ann. Boy, she's a great cook. Well, tell me about Mary Ann. How she handled finances? She's a great cook. How, how, no, I, I, that's, no, she's fairly good at finances. Okay, no, okay, let's get that clear. Um, how, how is she as a homemaker? She's a really great cook. You know, so if we just focus on one attribute, we miss out on the whole scope of who God is and his majesty and his magnificence. And so as we look at all the attributes of God, we are looking at some of his sovereignty this morning, but I just, we get sometimes caught up on things, don't we? And so when we see the whole picture of God, he's so magnificent and he is so wonderful as we know him through his different aspects of his attributes. So having said that, Let's start out uh, with this message of uh, God's wonderful, gracious, magnificent ways in which he deals with us. Listen to this. First point, we're lumps of clay, lumps of clay or clay pots. I had a friend who had a ministry called Clay Pots at one time. Anyway, but we're just these clay pots. We're these uh, pots that God has formed and we're all different. We're all unique. We all... Uh, think differently and act differently, have different cultures that we've come from. Whenever I put a couple together and we are meeting for marriage, premarital counseling, it's like there was a book written years ago, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. It's like different planets, different universes. So we come together culturally. We're all so different. Even in this body of believers here, there's such a wide variety of culture that it's significant that we understand that and we see things through God's lens. So verse 19 says this, one of you will say, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? Now I gotta stop there just for a second as we get started. I'll say it again. And, and, and Paul is answering the question here as to God and how he's working and how he chooses to work. And, and uh, so one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? So talking about how God worked through Israel and, and different people and how God's resisted, people have resisted God from the beginning of time and how in our, especially in our culture today we see it. But this question here, as I love this, he said, he talks about, in other words, why am I being held accountable? Why are we accountable for the, the consequences of, of life and what happens to us? Why, does, why is God saying these things to us like that, that, we're going to perish or, or God's choosing to set us aside to deal with us a certain way for a certain time. And then I, the statement here that I love is for who resists his will. What I love about this, and this is like with Pharaoh, with letting the Egyptian or the, the Israelites go, God, he resisted God, he resisted God, he resisted God, he resisted God. He re did you get, you get the point? He resisted God. And so really God was demonstrating his grace all this time. So we got to stop and say, ask ourselves the question, when we're resisting God's will and there's consequences in our life, who do we blame? We have no right to blame God. And this goes back to the statement here is we're these the pieces of clay, these clay pots that, that we, we, we reject and we choose to work against God's plan and purpose for our lives. So then when the wheels fall off, we can't be upset with God, right? When the wheels fall off, we have to say, well, what have I done to resist God's leading and directing, like the person of the Holy Spirit. Greatest gift in the New Testament is the person of the Holy Spirit. He's leading us and guiding us. When we resist the Holy Spirit, when we grieve the work of the Spirit, we hinder the work of the Spirit, and then, then things don't kind of go the way we think they should. We wonder, well, God, where are you? Where were you? Why, why, aren't you, why aren't you answering our prayers? So it's very important we understand the fact that God is this merciful, gracious God continually demonstrating his grace and mercy to us as a nation. When you think of the millions, billions of babies who've been aborted, you think, why doesn't God just wipe us off the face of the earth? When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, why didn't God just wipe, say, you know what, this isn't working out so well, we're going to start over. It's because God, even with fallen man, he loves mankind. He 
doesn't want anyone to perish. He didn't create hell for people. The reality is that God is in his mercy, sovereignty, he's working out his plan, and we as, as these hunks of clay have an opportunity to see his grace in action. So then he goes on to say here, but who are you, O man, to talk to God? Shall what is formed say to, say to him who has formed it, why did you make me like this? And one of the things, when I, when I think of a statement like that, of, of the questions that we ask God, it's like, where's the fear of God? You see, in our culture today, again, because we're gods, we have no fear of God. There's no reverence, there's no fear. So when we, we, the world we're living in today, we have every right to challenge everybody and anybody anytime we want, right? If the police pull you over, they have no right to pull me over. Or, or whatever uh, situations come into our lives, accountability at work where the boss calls you in for a review and says, you know, uh, you're really not doing your job. Well, who are you to challenge me? I mean, you're, you're, you're lucky that I even come to work, right? Right? I mean, you should be thankful that I showed up today. That's kind of our culture today. You talk to any employer, you're lucky to get people to show up, right? My goodness. Anyway, I could go on that for a while. Anyway, but who are, where's the fear of God? Verse 21 says this, does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay the same pottery for noble, or for, uh, noble purpose and for common use? Absolutely. God has a right to work in our lives any way he sees fit. And no matter where you find yourself in these situations of life, no man be God. No man be God. He is God. You're not. He's working. We may not always understand it, but he is a good God. He is such a gracious God. I am continually amazed when I, when, again, as I, you just watch the news and you see the horrific things that are going on in the world around us, and, and it's so hard to get your mind around the fact that God is constantly, continually, from the beginning of time, reaching toward mankind. Adam and Eve sinned. What did God do? He killed an innocent animal to cover them. So God, was, God has always been there. He's always been responding to us in a loving, gracious manner. Always. He is the God of grace. And that is one of my greatest passions is to know that and proclaim that. And my prayer for the church is we as a church are a grace-orientated church and that we continue to always be a grace-focused, grace-orientated church. Not legalistic, but a real living relationship with the living God in a love relationship. He loves us, and as a result of that, we desire to live for him and live in this love relationship with him. Next point is what if, 22. What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known before, with great patience, the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? This is a picture here of what he's referring to, these objects of wrath, was Israel. In this case, he's saying, you know, Israel, he gave Israel, and, and we go back to, um, let me see if I can find it here quick. Um, this idea of what he talked about, how the Israelites, how the Israelites were given, or the Jews, excuse me, the Jews were given everything. They were given the prophets. They were given, uh, they were given the prophets uh, this, uh, through David, the lineage of David, the Messiah. Uh, they were given the law. They were given the temple worship. The Jews had everything. The God presented everything to them. They were his people. They were to be the salt. They were to be the light. They were to be the bearers of the truth to the whole world and that God would use them to be the salt and the light for the world. And what happened? It didn't work out that way. So God, it says here that in his great patience, Toward Israel, and when you know, whenever I see God's, the scriptures talk about His great patience. I see the grace of God, the mercy of God in His great patience. Then He goes on to say in twenty three, "What if He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy?" And that's referring to Judah from the southern kingdom and how Israel had rejected the truth and Judah was responding to truth. But what I love about this here, He goes that that he was demonstrating, and that's for those of us who know the Lord and have a relationship with him, there should be such a great sense of utter humility and a sense of being undone and to think, to think of standing before a holy God and his righteousness that we have the boldness to enter into his throne room and that we are adopted as sons into his family. And because of our relationship with him, we should be in such total and utter awe of who he is and what he has done for us. And that should so deeply motivate us to want to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. 
You were in bondage to sin. You were in prison. You've been freed from that prison of sin. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I, I remember coming back from Guatemala and, uh, years ago, uh, and we were in the middle of a coup, and, and people were being shot and uh, decapitated when we were down there, and they were shooting up our bus we were on. Uh, we were on a chicken bus, and bullets were flying, and one had gone over the cliff. And I remember coming home and thinking, like, I'm really glad to be here. You know, I almost got down and kissed the ground. And, and I, remember, I remember that experience of just like, boy, I think I've got problems. You know, I think you've got problems. And it's like you're in this situation where it's literally life and death. I remember we watched on the news, it was on World News Tonight, that, that village that we were in, that they showed uh, bodies, hundreds of bodies at a Catholic school on the playground that were covered with blankets uh, who had been massacred, men, women, and children in this village that we were just in a month prior. So it's like you, you realize that sometimes you step back and you think, oh, the grace and the mercy of God that he has spared our lives, that we have the freedom to live in a country that we live in. My, how, how blessed are we as a people? So he goes on to say here, the riches of his glory to make it known. Verse 24, even us whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Again, when, when in the culture of the Jews at the time, the Gentiles weren't even human beings. They were referred to as dogs and not like Lassie. Okay, we think of a nice dog like Lassie or Gigi or Fifi or whatever. We were dogs. The Gentiles were referred to as dogs. We were less than human to the Jews. And so God's, God in his grace and mercy reached down to us dogs and he saved us and he spared us and he revealed the truth to the Gentiles. How wonderful. And we're all those, we're recipients of that. Then he goes on to say here, even us whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. It's all about God's grace. It's all about grace, God's grace and mercy. Then the next point here, the stumbling stone. And I just love this part of scripture, the stumbling stone. He goes on to say, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. Again, talking this a context of the Jews and the, the, those who'd be grafted in, the Gentiles. Then he goes on to say here in 26, and it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the sons of the living God. So when you think about not having a relationship with God, not even being uh, in the picture, how God in his understanding and his grace and his mercy brings us into, now we are, we are the sons of God. We're not Israel. The church is not Israel. I want to make that distinction. The church is not Israel. But we are part of being grafted in to this idea of the fact that we are, uh, we are the sons of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. All the truths and all the promises that have been set aside for us are just unbelievable. And it changes really our whole, our whole focus on life, our whole direction in life when we understand what God has done for us. People who didn't deserve grace have been shown grace. People didn't deserve mercy, we've been shown mercy. People who were, like I said, we weren't, as, as the Jews would look at the uh, Gentiles, not even worth crossing the street for, and here we're gonna be in eternity with the, with the Jewish believers. How wonderful is that truth? And then he goes on to say here, verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. And I love how Paul refers to the Old Testament, Hosea and Isaiah. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. And for the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. Here's the amazing thing again, all the light that was given to the Jews and all that were the, all the things that, that they had access to and, and the ability to approach God through the high priest as we just celebrated the Passover and the Day of Atonement and all the significance of all those things. That wasn't given to the Gentiles, it was given to the Jews. And then he goes, only a remnant. And you think of all the children of Israel and all the truth they've had, the whole Old Testament, which you never tell a Jew it's the Old Testament, but w when we understand that all that was said and all that was prophesied God extending his grace all this time to the children of Israel and to the world we're living in today and the darkness in the world today, how people, more and more people are searching for truth today than ever before. 
They're searching. We don't hear about it a lot, but there's a lot of Muslims who are coming to Jesus Christ. There are people from every walk of life coming to Jesus Christ. And the gospel continues to spread throughout the earth uh, in ways that we can't even begin to comprehend. And persecution continues to spread across the earth. And, and uh, uh, one of the things we're doing, we've recently joined a, a Christian organization that has a legal team that looks at everything that we do as far as our writings and our policies and things that they help us understand as we're crafting these things, especially with uh, same-sex marriage and, and all the different issues of the day. We're working with them and they're there to help us. That's what they do. So we're very excited about being part of this organization that helps us as a church be biblical, but it also helps us look at how are we doing things legally. Because ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, the next administration, depending on what happens in the future, everything's going to change. Everything's going to change. And even no matter how much we think we have our ducks in a row, it's not going to matter. The church is going to change within. We're just a few years away from maybe seeing one of the, we're in the process of it right now, of seeing one of the greatest changes in the history of this nation as far as religious freedom. We're right there. We're right there. We're just this close, ladies and gentlemen. The laws that are being trying to be passed and such are unbelievable. So, anyway, I could go off on that for a long time, and I won't. Anyway, so it goes on to say here, and I just love this in 29. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Or, and uh, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, it's interesting if you remember the story and you look at the story in Genesis, how an angel, uh, angels came with an angel of the Lord to Abraham and uh, to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and what they were going to be doing in judgment. So here's Abraham talking to the Lord. He said, if you find 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? And the Lord said, yeah, I'll spare the city. And then he comes back and he says, I dare to say this, Lord, but if there are 40 people that are found righteous, would you spare the city? I'll spare the city. Then he comes back and says, Lord, forgive me, but how about 30? Then he comes back again and he says, but forgive me again for asking, but how about 20 people would you spare? Sodom and Gomorrah. 20 people. Then he comes back one more time. He says, 10. Wow. Think about the grace of God. He's, here he's saying this is a city that is just rampant with every kind of sin. And it wasn't just homosexuality and things like that. These were crooked. I mean, just the layers of, cr- of wickedness and evil that was living in these places. And he comes down to 10 people. Will you spare the city if there's 10 righteous people? And we look at the grace and mercy of God. Wow. So when, when, when people say that God isn't a God of grace, like he isn't a God of mercy, he's this God of judgment, and he's this horrible God. I mean, we're talking all these people's lives down to 10. But I mean, the fact that, enough, had someone been talking to me, if I were, forgive me, if I were God, and I'm not, I know that, that someone were to come to me and say, 50 people, are you kidding? We're gonna, we're gonna burn this place to the ground. These people... They deserve everything they get, right? When you, when you hear of some kind of a crazed person killing a child or something, don't you in your heart want to say, yeah, hey, I'd let them go to hell. Well, you just take, let, kill them all and let God sort them out. But that isn't our God. That isn't our God. I mean, I, I, he isn't our God. He doesn't want anyone to perish. God delights not even in the most wicked sinner God doesn't, doesn't delight and say, yeah, we're going to cook this one. We're going to really burn this guy. It isn't our God. Our God, he, he hates to see people separate. He doesn't want to see anyone perish. He is a gracious, loving God. He didn't want to wipe out Sodom. He's, he was going to spare him for 10 people. Can you imagine that? So when we, see, when we see the grace and the mercy of God, it just blows my mind. I just, it, it's like you can't, because I wouldn't have done it. I'm, you know, and thank God I'm not God, but I'm just, and you would have too, okay, <laughs> right? I'm just keeping it real here, just keeping it real. You would have pulled the lever, you know? Let him have it. Anyway, I'm sorry. Just keeping it real. Okay, so then 30 says, what then shall we say? 
that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained a righteousness that is by faith, but Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. They had, again, they had the prophets, they had the temple worship, they had it all. They had not attained it. So faith comes by faith in what God has done and not in works, not in my righteousness. Then 32, why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. The Jews were trying to keep the law and be made righteous by the law. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Christ was the de- designed, designated end, the termination or purpose, goal of the law. He fulfilled the law perfectly. No one else could. So then he goes on to say here in, um, at the end of 32 that they stumbled over the stumbling stone, which was Jesus. They stumbled over him as the Messiah, the deliverer, the truth bearer, the son of God. As it is written, I, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So, as we look at the, the mercy and the grace of God and his, his sovereign, all-powerful God that he is, and then he goes on to say this, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Isn't it great to know that what you know and what you have in your life and your reality of your life is you will never be put to shame for being a believer in Jesus Christ. People may make fun of you. People may think you're nuts. They may think all kinds of things. But there is no shame in being a Christian. And, you know, it isn't until <clears throat> you see people put to death. Uh, I was recently given a book called Killing Christians, and Tom Gunner and I was talking about this of, in the Middle East, um, I forget the country offhand, but there was a brother who wanted to smuggle Bibles past these Muslims to get them into the city. And the way he did it was to hide underneath a corpse in a casket with his Bibles. Now, this is the hot sun, a decomposing body. I'm sorry, if kids, whatever, this is pretty graphic. But underneath a corpse, in a casket, in the heat, with Bibles, because the Muslims wouldn't be defiled by opening the casket. This is what he was doing to smuggle Bibles. Wow. Wow. There's people all around the world today who are suffering in all kinds of ways that we can't even imagine for the cause of Christ. So we need to continue to remember for, to pray for the persecuted church, but also to delight in the fact that we're free. We have this incredible freedom in this country, this, this opportunity to share the good news. We just had Easter, and I, I just, you know, pray that God will continue to move our hearts, us lumps of clay, us insignificant individuals who God sees as significant. Jesus died for you, each and every one. You've put your name in there. He died for you. He suffered for you. He rose from the dead for you, for you to live, not just this mamby-pamby, just getting through life by the seat of your pants, but to live a victorious life that he has given each and every one of us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we're in awe of your mercy, your grace, your love, and that you can choose to do whatever you want, whenever you want, to whoever you want. And we have no right to challenge or question you, but we know one thing, Lord, based on who you are and all your attributes, that you are a God of love and that you are a God of, that desires that all men to come to know you. And Father, give us the boldness to share those truths. Help us to enjoy what you've given us and help us to, to be those salt pieces of salt and light and truth to the world around us. And we ask this through the precious name of Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus made it so simple that it's faith alone in Christ alone, not our works, not trying to keep the law or the Ten Commandments. You did everything necessary. We just need to put our trust in what you've done for us and say, I believe that Jesus, you died for me and you rose for me so that I could be truly freed from my sin and never have to look back, never have to live a life of guilt or regret. Thank you for the new life that you've given us, that we've been born anew, born from above. We just praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen.